You are listening to History Man, a project of ekbarns.com, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's podcast, we feature Kip Carter, friend of the revolution, a historical guru of the Southern campaigns. So welcome, Kip. Thank you. I appreciate it, Eric. Kip, we're speaking today or or recording today from your home, which is actually sits on the battlefield at Hanging Rock, which is about 20, 25 miles above Camden. Is that correct? Uh, From the Camden battlefield to here is about uh, 18 miles. The the road in front of your property, uh, is it the Great Wagon Road? It is the Great Wagon Road. Runs from Philadelphia down to Charleston and Savannah. Uh, But through this part of the state, a lot of the road uh, has a lot of branches to it, but in this part of the state, it is the road. We're on the uh, the road runs along the uh, fall line between the Lynches and the Catawba River. So a drop of water in my front yard goes to the Lynches, and a drop of water in my backyard goes to the Catawba River. I mean, this road really was, oh, it the, was big, the big road. Of oh, yeah, it was the interstate highway. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so these battles in, say, in the southern campaign... Really, if you were if you were to figure out where that road was, the the Great Wagon Road in the colonial times, you could really just start matching up all of these battles. Up oh there, yeah, up the road. Battle of Camden, the Battle of Hobkirk Hill, the, ba- the skirmish at Beaver Creek, the Battle of Hanging Rock, Buford's Massacre. They're all on the Great Wagon Road. So, tell us a little bit about the first battle or Hanging Rock. The uh, the British had uh, captured Charleston in May of 1780 and began to expand their reach into the into the rest of South Carolina. They established outposts at uh, 96 at uh, over at Great Falls at a place called Rocky Mount. Uh, here at, at uh, Hanging Rock, which is most northern of their post, over to Sherall and then over to Georgetown. And so that basically allowed them to control the entire state of South Carolina. There had been a, a, a reversal on July 12th of 1780. Uh, uh, one of the patrol from uh, the British Legion under Tarleton, under uh, Captain uh, Christian Huck, had uh, burned Hill's Iron Works, had destroyed uh, some houses, uh, burned the library of the minister over at Fishing Creek, uh, and were looking for some of the rebels, including Bratton, William Bratton, So on uh, July 12th, uh, they were at Bratton, right next to Bratton's plantation at Williamson's, which is only about 600 yards away. Uh, Bratton and Hill and and the rest of the guys surprised them at daylight and wiped them out. That was July 12th. So that was the start of the idea here in the backcountry that they could defeat the British. There had been the terrible defeat of the Americans uh, at the end of May at at Buford's Massacre, where Colonel Abraham Buford's troops were pretty much wiped out. Uh, And uh, that's an interesting historic site to go see. We're in the process of trying to preserve it right now, uh, thanks to some people from Sun City, uh, a retirement community here. They've they've gotten a committee together to uh, help with that battlefield, and they've really done a wonderful job restoring I was surprised to see that there is a mass grave out there. There is a mass grave there. There's another one. We think we know where it is. We think we know where the five British dragoons that were killed there that day are buried. Okay. We think there's a mass grave within a quarter of a mile of where you and I are sitting right now. Pretty sure we know where it is. Wow. From this battle here at Hanging Rock. But anyway, oh, on the 30th of July, uh, two weeks after uh, Huck's defeat, defeat mm-hmm. Sumter decided that he wanted to attack Rocky Mount, which was one of the stronger outposts here. So he uh, detailed William Richardson Davy to bring his men, who were men from the Waxhaw and also men from Mecklenburg County, the Charlotte area, all mounted, of course. And uh, they were to come here to Hanging Rock to uh, create a diversion. Hanging Rock's only about uh, 12 or 15 miles from Rocky Mount, and he didn't want the troops here. There were about 1,500 trying to to reinforce Rocky Mount while he was attacking there, uh, much less to come up on him from the rear while he was attacking. So he sent Davy over here. Now, so there, there's a river between here and there. Correct? There is a river between here and there, the Catawba River, which turns into the Watery, 
right. down at uh, Camden. And there was a ferry that the British soldiers at Rocky Mount, they, they patrolled that road because there's a ferry at the end of that road that brings them over right. to this side of the, the watery. Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, there was a ferry that was also a, 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 a crossing, a, I see. Sh- a shallow crossing there. I see. And so Sumter attacked over at uh, Rocky Mount. It was a, a hard fight, and Sumter was taking the worst of it. It was a well-fortified position. Sumter decided to try to uh, burn them out, and he lost several really good men trying to throw burning uh, faggots up onto the roof of uh, two log houses that were reinforced that were there. And finally got one of the roofs burning but it was South Carolina, it was August, and it was a summer afternoon, and you know what happened. A thunderstorm came up and put out the fire. And so Sumter began retiring. And, of course, he did not retire without trouble. The, the British came out after him and uh, gave him a lot of trouble, and the river had gotten up. And Anyway, he finally made it back to his camp at Clem's Branch. Uh, on the east side of the river. But in the meantime, Davy had been sent down here to Hanging Rock to, to create this diversion, and Davy at, uh, attacked Colonel Samuel Bryan's North Carolina militia, who was the uh, outer ring of the British position here. The British had three camps here uh, from south to north, and the northernmost was Samuel Bryan's, and he was along the ridge line overlooking the Hanging Rock Creek and bisecting the road. Was he in a house? No, there was a house there, but it was not, not I don't know whether Bryan himself was in the house or not, okay. but there, there was a house up there, and there was a, a lane in front of the house. It was uh, on what's now called the Brown, was then called the Browns Ferry Road. The uniforms looked alike. I mean, oh, either. nobody was in uniform. Nobody these, was these in are, uniform. These, yeah, these are all civilians. You told them, you told it's, people would put a piece of paper in their hat. They'd put a, uh, a, a a green piece of pine bough in their hat to identify which side they were on. Everybody looked the same. In yeah. fact, sometimes they were brothers or fathers right. and sons right. on opposite sides. So my understanding is Davy just kind of rode right in and passed himself off as as one of the loyalists. Well, he split his command, uh, and he took half of them and, and, and rode past the sentries uh, in, into the lane where they dismounted and began an open fire, uh, much to the surprise of Brian's men, who thought they were reinforcements coming in. Davy had taken the rest of his men and, and, and gone all around to the western end and rode down the lane, uh, cutting down the guys who were trying to get away from the first group. The only way you can look at it is that it was kind of a slaughter. Davy came away with uh, 60 horses and 100 stands of arms, 100 muskets and rifles. Well, you know those guys didn't just hand them over. And he says, unfortunately, because he was under the eyes of the main British camp, he was unable to take any prisoners. And so I think we can take it from that. There was a, a great deal of slaughter and uh, dead and wounded on the on the uh, loyalist side. And before the British could react, he had ridden off with, with the horses and the guns. And uh, the British camp, of course, was in a good bit of consternation. They, they of course, did not reinforce uh, a Rocky Mountain result. And so a couple of days later, when Davy and Sumter got back together again, uh, Davy told him about what had happened down here. He knew the layout because he had seen it firsthand, and he knew this area from, from his childhood here. Uh, so he uh, told uh, Sumter what the layout was, that there were no fortifications. It was They were in an open field. They appeared to have a couple of cannon. They were little what they call grasshoppers, little three three-pounders. But they were devastating. You load them with canister. It's not a cannonball. It's a like a can with a lot of musket balls. It's in like it. a shotgun. Like a shotgun on steroids. A shotgun on steroids is yeah. exactly what it it, it is. Uh, but anyway, he told them what the layout of the camp was, and so Sumter decided to, to uh, attack Hanging Rock. So the night of the fifth of August, uh, they gathered up in what is now. The town of Heath Springs, the militia grounds up there, it's about two miles from there down to where the British were camped at at the area called Hanging Rock. Hanging Rock is actually about 600 yards to the east of where the British were, but it was a well-known landmark. Uh, It was uh, a big rock 
uh, overhang uh, for thousands of years. People had camped there using the, the Great Wagon Road was an Indian trail sure. uh, originally. Uh, but I made the mistake of thinking that the battle actually occurred down there at the rock. Yeah, that, and, and that, that, that didn't happen. The battle was up here uh, to the west of the rock on this big flat plain. Uh, on, on either side of the road. On either side of the road, I right. See, I see. But uh, in in the olden time, there, there was a trail or a road that went right beside that rock. Yes? Oh, yeah, there was. There was, uh, and because it was a good place to camp overnight. Right. In fact, uh, that's one of the places where Wood Mason preached. Really? Uh, yeah. In fact, he ma- he says he married 200 couples at the Hanging Rock I didn't in, realize in his that. diary. Yeah. So, so he would stand on the rock and uh, and preach. So you you can be if you're coming up in this area, it is a little misleading because there are plaques down there at the at the rock that kind of signify that this is where the battle happened or whatever, and you kind of are lulled into this idea that it happened down there. But from a topographical standpoint, it it happened up here on the road. So. You know, not only that, but from an archaeological point of view, we've done a lot of we've we've done some excavations up here. We know exactly where Brian's men were. Uh, we found hundreds of artifacts along the line that was Brian's camp. And so we know exactly where it was. Now, we don't, we're we not so sure about the other two British camps. We think we know where they were, but we don't know for sure. We know Colonel James Ingram's house was on the east side of the road. It is where Washington spent a night on his southern tour on his way to Charlotte which he referred to as a trifling little place in his diary. Uh, But anyway, he spent the night with Colonel Ingram, who was with the uh, Continental Line. And the British, of course, used Ingram's house and his well uh, for water. You you always got to think about water and forage for your animals when you're camping. And so, uh, you know, Brian had a couple of hundred men up there on, on the initial ridge, and he had, you know, a couple hundred horses in the pastures behind him in Cole's old field. Uh, you had to have, but you had to have water. And so you look for where the springs and where the wells were, and that gives you an idea of where the camps probably were. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty obvious that the British officers were using Colonel Ingram's house. He had a good well there. Across the road, there was another house, and there's a big spring behind it. Uh, this plane here had a number of springs on it. There's one here in my backyard. So it, this seems to be the logical place for the for the British, the two British camps. You had the Prince of Wales American uh, Regiment, and you had the British Legion. There were about 130 men from the British Legion here too. Anyway, uh, they gathered up at, uh, at on the night of August 5th. They decided to break into three uh, uh, wings, one to hit the center and one on each flank. Uh, they got lost in the dark, uh, ended up all in front of poor old Brian, who had been hit by Davy the week before, ended up right in front of Brian. And so they fought their way up the hill, uh, hit Brian, routed Brian. Brian fled to the southeast across the plain toward the main British camp, pursued by Sumter's men. And you got to keep in mind that Sumter's men were not well provisioned. They only had about five rounds of ammunition each. So they had to make their shots count. But anyway, they pursued the the, uh, the loyalists into the British camp. The, the British camp broke. It's a very convoluted fight. It, most Revolutionary War battles take a half hour or less. We reenacted the Battle of Cowpens on the 225th anniversary. We knew exactly where everybody was from diaries and, and pension applications. And we knew how many shots were fired. We knew when the battle started. Uh, and we reenacted it. And we were stunned to discover that the battle was over in 27 minutes. Wow. Yeah, most of these battles were short, sharp, and nasty. This battle lasted four hours. And so there was a lot of back and forth up the field. Uh, the British enfiladed the, um, one of the, the American position. The American riflemen then started making sure that they took out the officers and the sergeants. The Prince of Wales American Volunteers, which was a very well-trained regiment of uh, British... Provincials. 
provincials, yeah, they were well trained. Anyway, their officers were mostly all killed. The sergeants were killed and wounded. Decimated them. Uh, decimated, decimated, yeah. Them. Yeah, about 52% of the men were killed uh, or wounded. And so the American, uh, the Prince of Wales American Regiment never again fought as a unit. They were destroyed that day. The British uh, uh, Legion, there were 132 men. The, the uh, captain in charge of it was was killed early in the fighting. They ended up suffering over 50% casualties. They fought valiantly, but they suffered over 50% casualties. Tarleton was not here, by the way. And so, uh, you know, he, he writes after the battle uh, in his memoirs. He talks about how brave his men were and, and that they carried the day. But that it didn't actually happen. What happened was that they got pushed south down the Great Wagon Road here to the main British camp, uh, pushed through the camp. The Americans got into the British camp and and discovered all the things they didn't have, like blankets and coats and... Food. Amu- <laughs> uh, well, yeah, but the uh, powder uh-huh. and shot. Now, keep in mind, just, you know, because you capture their cartridges don't mean that you can use them because they were all different calibers. Right. And so, but you got the powder, and then you could melt the lead back down again later into balls to fit your guns. So, but they also got into the British rum supply. Now, why was there so much rum here? Nobody knew about germs in the in the 18th century, but they knew if they drank water, they got sick. They knew if there was a little rum in the water, they didn't get sick. They didn't know why. So almost everybody, nobody drank water. Everybody drank beer, small beer, near beer, wine. And so there was always, the Army always, there was a rum ration, of course, a uh, dram a day. But a lot of the rum was used to, to uh, put some in the water so that the soldiers wouldn't get sick, wouldn't get dysentery. And uh, so they had kegs of rum as well. Rum. So the Americans get into the kegs of rum, and pretty soon you got you got a problem. You got, you got all these guys who are inebri- inebriated. Now Davy's men were not among them. Davy kept his men in order. And while all this was going on, while the looting of the camp was going on, the British formed themselves into a, a defensive uh, position called a hollow square. You just make a square of men, and uh, you know the supplies were in the middle. And you're on the outskirts of it. You've got bayonets, and you know, so cavalry can't charge you, and uh, horses are not dumb enough to run onto a bayonet. Uh, and so, uh, it's a protective thing. And so they were in a hollow square, and their musicians were in there, and so they were playing music, and they were uh, giving three cheers for King George and shouting insults at the Americans. And and the American patriots were shouting insults back, and you know three cheers for the heroes of the revolution. Well, uh, while all this is going on, this is about. I feel like three, this is a Monty Python episode. Oh it, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. And uh, this has been this is at about three and a half hours into the battle. Well, a, a group of dragoons was coming from from uh, Rocky Mount over here, and then they were going to go down to. Uh, to Camden. Just happenstance. Just happenstance. There were about 80 of them, all told. And they were coming uh, toward this area, and they could hear the fighting. So they turned south and circled around the fighting and came back up the road. And they appear, there's a hill right here at the edge of the British camp, so they appear suddenly in the road. And so they displayed across the road to appear to be larger group than they were. But Davy took his men and attacked them, drove, and drove them off. He only killed one of them, but he, he drove them off. But the Americans were worried that they were the vanguard of a re- group of reinforcements coming from Camden. Right. And so they said, whoa, we're about to get in serious trouble here. So Sumter says to his, his, uh, his, uh, his colonels and his captains, uh, gentlemen, sometimes it's best not to pursue a victory too far. And so I think we we probably need to go. So they loaded up everything they had captured. They had uh, about 75 prisoners. 
They gave paroles to the British officers, which they took seriously. You know, you give your mm-hmm. parole that you're not going to fight again. And the British Army took it seriously, too. They'd send the guys back home. Anyway, the, so uh, Sumter and his men filed off with Davy in the rear guard, you know, protecting the uh, rear against any counterattack. And they went back to uh, Clem's branch. Now, by 18th century warfare rules, this means the British won because the British were still on the fields, and at sundown they were still there, and the Americans left, so the British, quote, won the battle. But two days later, they withdrew to Camden because they had been so mauled here. They withdrew down to Camden to recuperate and also discovered that Gates was on his way cross-country. Ten days later, Gates arrives, and you have the Battle of Camden. Now, had it not been for the timing, if the Battle of Camden had not happened... And as Sumter said, if one Continental officer had been here, this would have gone down as one of the great American victories of the Revolutionary War. But because there were no Continental officers here and because the Battle of Camden happened 10 days later, it it sort of is faded into history. Yet it was an incredibly significant fight here in the backcountry. That is a fascinating story in in three, four hours of fighting when knowing that they only have really a handful of bullets. So they're picking up, you know, they're they're picking up whatever they can to keep that battle going. That's exactly right. They're picking up muskets that the, that they captured and using that ammunition and, and fighting with it. And there are lots of interesting stories about things that happened during the battle. Uh, Judge Gaston had four sons here in the battle. Three of them were killed and the fourth one was, badly injured one of the guys on the on the patriot side was fighting along the ridge line there and suddenly whap he got hit in the hip and it spun him around and he and of course they were wearing knee breeches and he felt something you know falling on his on his calf and he thought i've been shot and i'm about to die well i'm not going to die thirsty you know they were all getting thirsty because of the heat so he he runs back down to Hanging Rock Creek and he falls face first into the creek and he's drinking water. And so he's now he's he's, you know, recovering himself and he thinks, Oh, how how bad is this wound? How bad is this wound? And he looks down and the bullet has hit his powder horn and that was powder falling out, his powder falling out down his leg and he thought it was blood. Oh, so so he goodness. went he went back to the fight after that. But there are a lot of interesting family stories uh, that took place. Uh, some of the guys that fought here, their father was a loyalist, and uh, they were coming over here to fight, so they didn't want uh, their father telling the British, so they tied him in his bed uh, and left him while they came over here to fight. There, there are a lot of fascinating stories uh, in the community of you know about things that happened here on that day. So, uh, just like Andrew Jackson, he was 13 years old. Uh, his brother was 16. And his brother was wounded here in the battle. Uh, Andrew Jackson carried messages for Davy. Andrew Jackson thought Davy was the finest man he ever met. And he said he wanted to model his life on Davy. Of course, he didn't, but uh, he really admired Davy. And Davy used him as a messenger some during the battle. In fact, uh, Davy gave him one of his pistols to carry uh, for protection, but probably he spent most of the battle holding the horses. When men rode into battle, uh, you, if four guys rode into battle, somebody had to hold the horses, so one guy held the horses and three people went to fight. So there were a number of people holding horses uh, for the militia. There were probably eight or 900 horses, and so a lot of uh, older men, young boys, and a few of the fighting men would be holding the horses while the other guys went to battle. And Jackson says that he could hear the battle raging above him. British had uh, established themselves along a ridge line on the south side of Hanging Rock Creek, and the Great Wagon Road ran right through the middle of their position, so they were, in fact, guarding the road. And, uh, and it's a very sharp decline down to the creek, and the militia horses were all being, being held down at the creek, and so the battle was about 
30 or 40 feet above him. So that's why uh, Jackson says he could hear the battle raging above him. But Jackson was at the second battle. It's interesting, the controversy around Sumter. Oh, yeah. No, Sumter is is a very controversial character in many ways. Later in his career in the U.S. Senate, he bought the property where American artillery this is a this is a whole new story, but this uh, we were going to have three places after in the early 1800s to train troops. The artillery is going to be trained here at Great Falls, the infantry at uh, West Point. Uh, there were going to be three arsenals, okay. uh, you know, for cavalry, infantry, and for the for the whole nation, for the whole nation, for the whole nation. Yeah, and so, and so it was built. Uh, they actually built a uh, facility here at, at Great Falls. And the land was bought by Sumter a couple of days earlier for, you know, like $25,000. And they sold it to the government for $3 million three days later. But, it, you know, wow. people thought that that was uh, a little underhanded. A little underhanded, yeah. yeah. But Sumter was, uh, you either loved him or hated him. And a lot of people hated him. Uh, some people say that after he was wounded at Blackstocks and wasn't able to take the field for about six months, that it was the greatest thing that happened to the American Army. Was it, you know, he he wasn't uh, he wasn't there, but yet he he won some battles and uh, was you know very charismatic and 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 drew men to him. And Sumter understood that when you had militia coming in, that sitting around in camp. It was not uh, a good thing. It was not a good thing. So he was very active. And these were all mostly, not all of them, but most of them were young guys, and so they wanted to be active. And uh, he and he was active. Right. And so that attracted people. What would you want people to take away from their visit to South Carolina in regards to the Revolutionary War and their visit to this area that, that you find yourself in? Well, the truth is that the... Uh, Revolutionary War had stalled in the North, and it had turned into a stalemate by uh, 1778. And the British realized that, and they decided that New England really wasn't worth having. They were willing to give up New England, but the real uh, value to in the colonies were the southern colonies and the mid-Atlantic. And so they began the southern strategy in 1779. And so uh, this is where uh, the American Revolution was won, was in in the Carolinas, and in particularly South Carolina. People say that the revolution was over after Yorktown, but that's not true. Uh, Yorktown was near the end of the war, that's for sure, and it certainly broke the British will to continue the war. But the war continued here in the South. There was a major battle at Utah Springs. And if you if you look at the history of the American Revolution with an objective eye, the the revolution was really won here in the South. It you know started in the North, but it was won here in the South. Kip, thank you so much for your time with us today. I'm very happy to do it. Mm-hmm.